what is even why why have sound money? The gold and the silver is always the protector against those inflationary cycles. Always. We have a very special guest today on Coffee with Lynette, Dr. Alma True Ott. Now, Dr. Ott received his accounting degree from Southern Utah University in 1982. As a promising young man, he went to work for the Intermountain Finance Group and in 1984 was trained in derivatives, including futures markets and all that sort of garbage. But he spent a lot of time on Wall Street and learned how America operated financially. At the end of his training, and this is the part that really excites me, guess who their very special guest was? Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And he spoke to these graduating attendees, now uh, trainees. Now, I'm going to let him tell you, Dr. Ott, tell you this story. But this fateful meeting impacted him for the rest of his life and sent him on a 25-year quest to research and understand money and the power of the central banks. He's published many, many articles and books on these topics, as well as nutrition, because he's done a lot of things in his lifetime. But between 96 and 2001, he had a radio show called The Story Behind the Story, which won the Peabody Award for Radio Documentary at his station, K-Sub Radio. But he also received a PhD from American College in 1994 in nutrition and is the founder and owner of Mother Earth Minerals. So he focuses on two key areas that you know are near and dear to my heart, your health and your wealth. Dr. Ott, we need to have that health conversation on BGS since health is a critical element in maintaining a reasonable living standard. But today, I'd like to focus on the wealth part. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I'm particularly interested in your early Wall Street training and your in-person experience with the much lauded Paul Volcker. <laughs> so could you please share with us and our viewers what that experience was? Because we do see that many people want the Jerome Powell to be a Paul Volcker and I have different opinions around what happened then and as well as I do now, but I'd like to hear about your personal experience, Dr. Ott. Well, thank you. It was definitely a, an experience. When I, I liken it like driving a Ferrari down the Autobahn or, or, or the freeway <laughs> at 170 miles an hour and hitting reverse and oh. stripping your gears because that's really what happened Whoa. in my life. Keep in mind, I... I Graduated in accounting, went to work for a, a brokerage firm, actually, and received uh, a scholarship for four weeks back to Wall Street. I, I, I guess, I uh, don't need to, to brag, but they told, me, they told me I was in the top two percentile in aptitude for this. So there was, it was high level, more or less elite training. So I didn't know what any better. I was just out of, out of college. I was looking... Mm -hmm to take the world by storm and uh, was, was happy to have the opportunity. And it was that, it was a great opportunity. So imagine 20 uh, individuals that were select hand chosen for this special week, uh, down to four weeks uh, there in the Marquis Marriott, top of, top of the food chain. And we were absolutely given the back, the back seat pass, if you will. We were given the golden ticket and we began the, the week, uh, early morning, wake up, call, uh, breakfast and a bagel, and over to uh, the New York Stock Exchange and to ring the bell. That's what we were privileged to do. That was how it all started. And it was a whirlwind the whole four weeks. Just one day after another, it was like, wow, yeah, amazing information, backseat passing on how to do it. I, uh, I was a young newly married Mormon boy from Utah. 
and I was surrounded by uh, there's about four or five uh, of the of the female persuasion with us, but mostly they were they were uh, young men wearing the yarmulkes. They were they were Jewish persuasion. And I had no problem with that. My roommate was Jewish. We had some, some uh, we, we get along very well. And it, so I, 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 there was some nomenclature that was used that I wasn't aware of being not really Jewish. What, uh, uh, what struck me was Mr. Volker's introduction. This was the final day of the four weeks. We, I was scheduled after his presentation uh, in the, um, middle of the afternoon to, to take the, the shuttle taxi cab to the airport and fly back home. So this is the wrapping up time. Okay, it was like the the cherry on the top of the uh, of the shake, if you want to call it that. It and was, this was 1982. 1984. 1984. Okay, 1984. we want everybody to have this in context. Yes, ma'am. It's important. It is. Um, Volker was, uh, we didn't, we weren't even told who was going to be there. It was this, this special, you know, uh, send off from one of the most important speakers. And keep in mind the whole four weeks, we had, a uh, three or four per week of some very high hitting people, heavy hitting people. Um, Paul Exeter was one of my, was a chairman of Citibank at the time, one of the very big banking magnates. And we had people. Uh, head of head of Goldman Sachs that came in and and these were the the top of the food chain if you want to call it that. So it was interesting to see who would who would be the final uh, wrap up speaker. And as he came in, he was introduced as chairman of the Fed Reserve, the the New York Fed, um, Paul Volcker. Well, this is about as you know top as top of the food chain as you can get. He came in and. I was privileged to be not five feet away from him as he addressed us. And keep in mind this whole four weeks, we learned how to do arbitrages. We learned how to do um, Forex trading, uh, currency exchanges, commodities trading of the, of the highest order. So, and then not to, not the least of which was learning how to evaluate and identify up and coming stocks and, 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 initial public offerings, IPOs. So we were given all of this. Now, okay, how are we, how are we going to gel it together? So this was what uh, we, we were, were all looking at. Okay, you've got insider knowledge that not many people had. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was expecting to have, you know, that all really kind of mesh together. And Mr. Volker comes in and uh, proceeds to give each one of us a laminated index card that had some red numbers on it. They was, it was uh, protected, of course. He said, these are very important numbers. You never have these leave you. These are direct line numbers to the various mints of the world. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, the United States mint, the, the mints, the, the South African Johannesburg mint, the Canadian mint, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, these are special numbers. They're direct line numbers. You are, look to, you, you, you always keep these in mind because this is what you will need to do. He, he was matter of fact about everything. It was like, oh, we were just subordinates and he was giving the orders as, you know, a general on, a, on, a, on, the, foot, on the battlefield. So he basically started the conversation this way. He brought in a, metal wastebasket, a you know, small, small one, and put it up on the table where he was, where he was present, presenting, proceeded to pull out of his, his coat pocket a very large, long Cuban cigar. I'm assuming it was Cuban, it was pretty green. But he bit a cop, bit the end of it off, put it into the, the, the wastebasket, put it into the corner of his mouth, and then pulled out a money clip and he peeled off the first bill in the money clip, Lynette, and I was very close to him there. I thought, well, this, this is different. It didn't, it didn't look like a regular greenback. It was brown in color, dark color. He pulled it up and he, he, he flipped it and then he turned it around and showed us. And it was, if I remember correctly, it was uh, 
President Woodrow Wilson on the front. But what struck me was looking at all the zeros. It was a $100,000 bill. Oh, oh, okay. okay. And I'm sitting here doing a double take. I didn't know there was such a thing <laughs> there. Can you, can you break a $100,000 bill, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was internally for the central banks. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know what what good those would be uh, other than just to carry around and show people. I I don't know, but it's a, but he did have one, and and he, his whole message was he took that bill, crumpled it up, then brought out his his gold looked like a gold plated lighter, lit it, and then proceeded to burn the bill, and then he turned it upwards and lit a cigar with it. That was the that was the metaphoric message, right? So he lets the, the bill burn and then drops it into the metal waste wastebasket. And it proceeds to puff away, you know, and and I'm not a fan of cigar smoke, especially that close. And he was blowing it out pretty thick. Well, then he proceeds to look at us all, just, just kind of stare at us all. And clearly the impression was I have big mucks to burn. I have money to burn. But he went and he, he brought out another hundred thousand dollar bill from his money clip and pointed and showed us all again. He says, now this is not for you. This is for one thing only. And he said, and I'll never forget these words. He said, this is for the consumption of the goy. Now I had no idea what goy meant uh, as a young, young, twenty-something year old, and I look. I had my notepad, my legal pad, and I wrote FOI. I thought it was maybe an acronym, freedom or um, FOI, GOI, gross over income. What is it? You know, what is GOI? I didn't ring a bell as an acronym, so I wrote GOI question mark question mark. You know. What does that mean? But nobody else seemed to know. Everybody else seemed to know what it was. I had no, I was just the only one in the dark. So I looked around and everybody's like, just kind of nodding their heads. And then it proceeded. The next part of his message was, you do not use these. He brought out and he showed us the other $100,000 bill. He, he, his, his central message was, this is not for you. You need to do something else, and he brought out in his um, in his one uh, suit coat suit pocket a handful of gold coins, and shook them clink 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 clink. They make a, a kind of a, a neat sound when they clink they them together that way, you know. <laughs> and then he he just showed them. There were there were some U.S. gold eagles. There yep. were. That's great. Yeah. Uh, of course, they weren't in the plastic. They were no. they were just in his raw. Pocket. Yeah, 1984, and, they would have been raw. Yeah, and so he he took the he had others. He had Krugerrands and maple leaves, mm -hmm. uh, and others others just to show. As he clinked them together, he said, "These is these are what you buy. You do not." Use these, and he showed us the the note payable again, the 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 Federal Reserve note. The recipe he was giving us was you just you take all your profits after expenses, which would be your net profits. He said, do it quarterly, or even monthly if you can. And you buy these. Use this. You call these these numbers, and you can bank wire transfer into it and we will provide you these gold coins in a special numbered box and then he gave us also numbers you know the numbered uh, accounts to set up number numbered bank accounts with and they were there was uh, swiss bank accounts cayman island accounts and even a few onshore accounts okay so so you this is how you do it that was the message. That was his only message. 
So basically and saying that you should take these, any profits that you make in fiat, and convert it to real money gold. Exactly. That's what he was saying. He didn't say real money gold. He just said gold. Okay, he just did right. those. Yes, it's a. They were not in in plastic at the time. They were all. They were bright and shiny and beautiful, of course. So here I am. He he burned a hundred thousand dollar bill to show that it was worthless. And then he said, "You take those the profits and turn them into that." <laughs> Very good. And. The second part of his message was he had a George Washington $1 bill. And he says, it may not be in my lifetime. It will probably be in your lifetimes. You will see this. Where the, 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 the $100,000 Woodrow Wilson would not be any different than the $1 bill. Now, I didn't quite understand what that meant either. I'm sitting there, what? <laughs> like I said, the Ferrari was was stripping the gears. Right. I was not expecting that. Uh, the least thing, I mean, really, the last thing I would expect was that. So that was his that was his five to ten minute spiel. That was it. So what did you um, at, at what point did you understand what he was trying to tell you? Because there were a few things in there. Number one, and I became a stockbroker in the same time period, 86. So this was 84. So we share a lot of things in common wow. uh, as far as that goes. And do you think that what he was really trying to tell you is that what this $100,000 bill currently can buy you, that purchasing power, will only be worth a dollar's worth of purchasing power because of the inflation. Because he, he's lauded as the great inflation fighter, right? Mm -hmm. I see that in the rear view mirror in retrospect was yes, that's what he was saying. But at the time, I didn't know what in the world he meant. I, know, it was shocking to me. So what did you take away from that? Well, after uh, the shock of it, because I was like, my knee-jerk reaction, Lynette, was this guy is just way old-fashioned. <laughs> he's uh, he's got to he's got to get out more type of thing, you know. He's <laughs> I really shame on me for that attitude. Well, because I, you know, but you were young, and here you are, you know, this Federal Reserve, you know, really. This is what I would like to talk to you about a little bit. During that period of time, he famously raised interest rates intraday up to 21.5%. Right. Now, that was credited with breaking the back of inflation, but I often want, thinking about that whole period of time going back before that, because as you well know, we transitioned from a, at least a quasi gold standard into a pure debt based standard. And the central banks were really given full control over inflation. And the key tool that they've used are interest rates. So I feel as if they needed to push interest rates up high to create this 40 year, how many year bull market run in bonds, because from there forward, you know, that was the peak. And then every time we hit a recession, well, what'd they do? They lowered interest rates five and a half to five and three quarters percent to inspire people to borrow and spend. So, um, you know, even though that was credited as far as breaking the back of inflation back then, and we look at what the global central banks are doing today, yes, thinking yes, that yes. they're being so aggressive. But, you know, I wonder if that that wasn't the start the, of raising the interest rates to give them ramp room and to give them a tool to regulate the rate and speed of inflation. I, I would concur with that because he was making it clear 
this was multi multi years in the planning. As he said it best, I won't see it in my lifetime, mm -hmm. but you may very well see it in yours. Okay, so yeah. it's looking probably a forty year spread, I would think, thirty to forty year spread, and so it, it was clearly something that was not just in a decade. It had to be more like three or four decades, and so it was. And then it could, it would also be uh, three or four decades in the rearview mirror too. So mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to second guess when you look at history, but if you're part of the ones making the history, they're the ones with the plan, right. not us. Okay. So we can, we can speculate and, and that, but I'm not a prophet. I have no crystal ball and I sure I do not sit in their big meetings. Right. And he, he did make it and he did say this, it was not him doing it. He said, the people, the men I work for. Interesting. The people I work for. Yeah, I, prob I would probably say, I I've interviewed a number of, of people in the know on this over the years, Lynette, and I would say probably 300 to 400 people at, at the top, top, top. Mm -hmm. People say, well, Klaus Schwab today or um, Harari. And, no, no, those are lower rung people. Yeah, they are. Uh, they really are, but, you know, um, well, let me ask you something too. Going back to that period of time, uh, my alma mater was Shearson. And I remember so much of everything was about globalization, globalization, globalization. And I remember thinking at that time, yeah, well, I don't know how well that's going to work out. And then you saw jobs shipped out. But during that period of time, and now we're supposedly going through a deglobalization now, <laughs> You're right? right? Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Because I know you have to remember that everything everything was about globalization in the eighties. I I, I I kind of would call it a macro view versus a micro view too. Mm -hmm. They needed to expand uh, the the money supply globally, and they. Again, the, the, the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, all of that set the stage for the U.S. dollar to become the world's reserve currency, and there was a, a wide, wide range of that. So that's important in the globalization, but when they get that goal of finish, then it's to micronize it. In my opinion, that's what they would be doing with it, to go shrink the market up. And I think it's part of their agenda. If you look at the Rockefeller Foundation and what they're trying to do is to also kind of restrict the human population in that respect too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very much a part of, of the agenda. They, they really do believe, I think they're crazy, but they believe that there's too many humans on the, on the world right now. There's too many humans on this rock. And so part and parcel of this in my research has been to you mentioned health and wealth coming together, very much so. It's no oh, absolutely. accident that the same eight families also control the, the oil in the world and the big pharma of the world. Right. Same families. And big pharma controls so, all the seeds and the foods. Yeah, I mean, exactly. this is just over the time of consolidation and consolidation. That's actually, um, I did not, it's been a while since I trusted the, the food supply chain. It's, and it's a big reason there are two big reasons why I started my food forest in Phoenix and my bug out location with the food up there. Because what we know is that, um, you know, I, I, I ate organic before it was popular to eat organic. Oh, good for you. And when you good bought a, an apple, an organic apple, it looked like you just picked it from the tree. So it would have its blemishes. I mean, it wasn't perfect. You go into any grocery store right now and you go to the organic section and that stuff looks absolutely picture perfect, yep. right? And if they can dumb you down, if you're not eating food that supports your brain function as well as your body function and your immune system, but you can think more clearly. And if you can think more clearly, then it is possible that you can see the garbage, <clears throat> excuse me, that's happening all around us. And with the money supply, I mean, they came out and admitted that they, the Fed did, that they don't understand inflation. Well. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> I 
I mean, that's my, laughable. It's completely laughable. I mean, yeah, we can do as much of this as we want, and that's not going to create inflation. No. No, it's so, uh, it's it really is quite uh, quite comical. You have to laugh at it. But are they really that inept? Uh, maybe now I don't know. You made it made the point uh, the 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 Bernankes of the world and the Volkers of the world. You know, I I, I just uh, the Fed is is it even relevant anymore in in looking at the the BIS um, and the and the whole agenda of the 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 coming digital currencies, you know. So I think I may be by design too. Um, I'm speculating now, but it's just like put some idiots in charge and it makes them irrelevant. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it, it creates scapegoats. Um, I think that Powell, I've read enough of his work to think that he's he wishes that he was a Paul Volcker in that he wishes that he had the cojones to actually raise interest rates above the real rate of inflation. I don't think that would stop it anyway, because we're at the end of the currency's life cycle. Um, but what do you think about, you know, having met Paul Volcker and you're looking at Jay Powell, what do you think about the two of them? Uh, totally complete apples and oranges. I think one was relevant. I think one is totally irrelevant. Okay. Well, that was the beginning. This is yeah. the end. Yes. And I think there's a reason for everything. I, they, they do do nothing without having it be for the goy to consume. Okay. That well, goes what back you mean to, by that is the general public, right? The general public, keep them, keep them dumbed down, keep them, keep them hypnotized by the media. And all is good in the world. That's why they control the media too. And this, uh, they want you to believe it's all some nonsensical conspiracy theory, but it isn't. It's right. just common sense when you just look at it. So Volcker finished up his little presentation and then just basically asked, was there any questions? Well, I kind of let go of my question, what is GOI? <laughs> <laughs> Good thing. Because, I mean, everybody else seemed to know what it was. I wasn't, uh, okay, I didn't want to appear too ignorant, right? But the big question was clearly, and nobody seemed to want to answer, ask the question. We'd spent four weeks of intense back room yeah. trading, insider trading, to learn how to diversify portfolios, to, to manage risk, right? And one of the big key things is, is to spread the risk out. An actuarial table is all about a large pool, right, of, of potential risk. So I asked him, I said, my, I was, raised my hand, he looks at me, and, he, and he, I'll never forget him. He looked at me and says, you're the Mormon boy from Utah. <laughs> what? Did you, did you have it stamped on your forehead? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I didn't have a yarmulke on, I don't know. But uh, I said, yes, sir. He goes, you question. I said, Sherman Volker, with all due respect, we spent the last four weeks learning how to diversify risk. Why are you now telling us to put all of our eggs into one basket? Yes. You know, he didn't even act like he heard my question. He acted like it was, <laughs> he didn't laugh or he didn't smug. It wasn't smug, but you know how long it, it, how about three minutes is when you're in a, that type of, uh, he just Yes, let it I sit. do, <laughs> actually. And he, 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 he puffs away on his stogie, which is still still going, and, he's, and he does some pretty good smoke rings. He just puffs and blows some smoke rings out. It's like mesmerizing, okay? But enough of that, it's now three, four minutes. Did you, do I need to re-, re rephrase the question and he just said he says this is how he answered he reached back into his pocket brought out his gold coins plinked them again click 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 clink clink and said until you have these you have no eggs 
I asked him, I says, isn't that what putting all eggs in one basket? Why should we put all of our eggs in one basket, sir? So you have these, you have no eggs. Now, so this is the that's chicken. It. This is what creates all of the eggs. Yes, those are the eggs. <laughs> and who they, knows more about money than central banks? And he knew that we had just gone on to this debt standard controlled by his job, the central bank. So that's what I just like, I was almost in shock. I was like, what? Okay, you came out here and burned a $100,000 bill and said, this is not for you. It's for the consumption of the goy. Now you're saying that unless you have these gold coins, you have no eggs to be even put into a basket. Yeah, I was, uh, like I said, my gears were stripped for that. I mean, it was like, I, I, what in the world? This is, this is the cherry on 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 the Sunday. This is the, the top. And I, I, to, I guess I was in some cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. My only way to, to to survive that was to to say, well, this guy's eccentric, and really not with it. He's out there. <laughs> You know, he's old fashioned as he's as old fogey as his stogie, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, I think that what he was really telling you was that these were on a path of destruction by design, because that's the way the whole system was designed was to inflate away your wealth so that number one, governments could charge you taxes without having to go through legislation so the inflation tax because they get the money before you do and corporations get to actually pay you less and less for your labor because again that inflation tax you know you look at what the average wage is now and my god we have people that millennials that are earning 250,000 a year and are living paycheck to paycheck so he wasn't really very far off with that $100,000 bill, which were actually, those were used inside of the system between central banks, right? Okay. So it was a yeah. way to transfer a large amount of money. And it, it's interesting because I have it, I don't know. I don't know where I put it, but I remember 2000, it was 2008 and I was in an airport. I was on a trip and I was coming back and I was sitting there, so I picked up a, People magazine, just for a little bit of, you know, to shut my brain down a little bit. And in there, I have this ad, I saved it and I framed it. There was, uh, it was, it was from the Federal Reserve and there was a hundred thousand dollar bill there. And then underneath it was a penny. And it was, and this was a gold, it was a hundred thousand dollar gold certificate. And they actually were likening that gold certificate to how you have not even lost one penny. Well, we're talking nominal terms, obviously, but that's what they were. Oh, this was on FDIC insurance. It was on so that you would not run on the bank in 2008 <laughs> when everybody was oh, panicking. Wow. Yeah. That's what that ad is. And I know I have it. I know that I framed it. Uh, so I have it somewhere, but um, it's interesting that, that he brought out that hundred thousand dollar bill because wow. I, I mean, yeah. I remember, I remember uh, one time a, a somebody that was doing business with my father came to the house and, and he wasn't there at the time. And he gave me 12 $1,000 bills. Wow. I sat on the sofa holding them. I was too afraid to put them down because I didn't want to <laughs> lose them. But people don't remember, because a lot of people weren't alive when this happened, that we actually did have $500, $1,000, $5,000, and $10,000 bills that you and I could have used, right? Right. They didn't demonetize them, but they quietly took them out of circulation. So when one got deposited in the bank, it just never left. Now that $100,000 bill maybe spends like a $5 bill. I mean, I might be exaggerating a little. But do you think 
that we have entered a period beyond central bankers' control? Do you think that we have entered a period of hyperinflation? What do you think? I think absolutely yes to that. We just don't know it yet. And I, I, I submit to you, the people in the Weimar Republic really didn't know it when it was happening either. Mm -hmm. It takes you know a couple of years to say, what just hit us? I'm sure the people of Venezuela and the people of Zimbabwe would say the same thing. I just don't know. It's something that you don't see until, it's, until you look back in the rearview mirror on it. So, but all the signs are definitely there. Uh, the the fact of what's what's happening, uh, and I've I've been following world events and kind of getting getting a little bit more insight into what I was what I experienced in 1984. Because yes. look, look what happened uh, when uh, we pulled out of Afghanistan so so oh. terribly. I mean, we left all we left literally pallet loads of hundred dollar Federal Reserve notes on the tarmac. Okay, what is that about? I mean, billions of dollars sitting there. But then we also see the story behind the story, if you will. We see that Putin and Russia comes in to the OPEC nations, particularly Saudi Arabia. And say we will never let that happen to you, brother. Look at look at you know we would not leave you hanging here. So look, we we're going to be able to give you better defense than the U.S. They don't care about about their Muslim brethren. We do, okay. And in fact, it was ten days after the pullout of of uh, in in Cabal that there was a, and it was amazing that the mainstream media never covered this. But but Russia and Putin signed a strategic defense contract with the oil producing nations, Saudi Arabia's on the head. And that was huge to me. Yeah. Absolutely huge. Because Especially with, with that, the petrodollar, right? Exactly. So if you don't have the US dollar, the Federal Reserve note, I should say, not the silver dollar anymore as the as a base petrodollar currency, you are basically cutting the string to any uh, of the the reasons why the U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve note, as world's reserve currency, has kept inflation in check. Right. Really. Right. Uh, on a macro scale, when that happens, there are only other way, other result. I, I I said this in lectures back in two thousand and eight and two thousand nine. When that I have a video recorded lectures that I gave on this subject. I said the only thing keeping us from seeing. Uh, inflationary cycles like Zimbabwe or the Weimar Republic is the the re world reserve currency status. Mm -hmm. If that is cut, there's so many nonsense dollars floating around in the in the world debt. Will this will make the I mean hyperinflation records? Yes, so, I I would agree with that. And you know, additionally. There has been so much talk over what the last maybe four or five, six months um, about the U.S. dollar losing its world reserve currency status. Yes. I don't think yeah. that's an accident. Especially when you see the ruble now and, and Putin backing it with gold like the U.S. dollar used to be. I well, I don't know that they're. I don't know that they're actually backing it. They definitely have accumulated it to be in a position to take this offensive. Let me rephrase that. They're backing okay. it to the with the with the petrol uh, market in in gold, and okay. Saudi Arabia is following suit. They're now taking their their gold, and I guess they do produce quite a bit of gold in Saudi Arabia, and they're now backing that also with gold. So it's really. The whole thing combined is causing the erosion of the Federal Reserve note like never before. And again, I don't think that is accidental. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, the powers that be knew that, uh, well, they could easily protect protected Kabul and Afghanistan and not, as, not give us a real black eye with the OPEC nations. But that's what happened. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's it's uh, under the under the disguise of, of the... The Ukrainian conflict, uh, we just uh, create the monster that that is that is Putin creating all of this the surge in in the gas prices. That's nonsense. 
I mean, total nonsense. I mean, here in Utah, I know for a fact that almost 100% of our oil comes from our own strategic resources that are pulled out of eastern Utah. We have huge oil fields there. We have the Bakken oil fields in, in the Dakotas. We really don't have a lot of dependence on, on Saudi oil other than just the price points. Right. Okay? So and and you remember the oil crisis back in the 70s. Yes. As we were making yeah. this transition. I mean, everything that was accompanying the currency shift from a quasi gold standard to a debt standard, are you seeing, I, I mean, do you see what I see? Because I see the same things appearing again. I absolutely. Yes, 100% so. Very much so. Uh, but it goes back to again, what is what is even why why have sound money? The gold and the silver is always the protector against those inflationary cycles. Always, it's not so much an ROI, return on investment. You look at though that's been great in 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 your market. I mean, you guys have concentrated, as I see it, on those uh, those numismatic. That that's there's nothing holds a candle to right. the value of those numismatics as an investment. Nothing does. Exactly. My Paul opinion. Volcker was 100% right in that. He was not eccentric. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. You know what's amazing? Uh, when I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll admit it. I, I was stupid. I was, I, I should have been more humble and should listen to Mr. Volcker. I wish I had. But I came back home, uh, gave a report to, to the head of, of my, my company that I was working for, Intermountain Financial Group. And they just basically poo-pooed uh, like I did Mr. Volcker's response. Well, you know, first of all, gold and silver is, is not romantic to invest in. Uh, it's not flashy, you know, uh, high risk uh, mutual funds, that type of thing, and, and subprime. Subprime mortgages, packaging that is always going to be good, they said. So we did focus on on that. Uh, and I was quick to to jump on that bandwagon because I, I, I said, who wants to invest in coins? <laughs> See, I'm very grateful for my Uncle Al because <laughs> even when I was a stockbroker, I always made sure I always told my people and even helped, even though I didn't make money at it because it didn't really matter to have the collectible coins, gold and silver. So I was always, I was always in there, in that camp. So I've been following, you know, the, the numismatic guarantee um, corporation, NGC, and what they've been doing, putting things, serial numbering, the uh, MS seventies and that type of thing. We started, I think in 1986, if I'm not mistaken. And so you see the, the pre 1933 numismatic gold issues, Nothing, nothing has held a held a candle to their to their ROI. Right. I don't care what it is. It's the best investment, period, ever. And you know what really drives that, Lynette? It's not you or me. It's the elite of the it's, world. It's the exactly. Paul Volkers. You are so right. When I put up a graph of the rarities. I mean, it's in the stratosphere and it never left the, the stratosphere. And these are coins that, you know, maybe a million dollars or more, 8 million, 16 million for one ounce of gold. There's a reason. Exactly. There's a good exactly. reason. You know, you can't really, you, it's, it's really hard to, uh, to put a, a Mona Lisa in your back office. <laughs> okay. Exactly but the value of these numismatics are, are so amazing. We're of the generation where we really had a value. There was a value to privacy. That That's one of the other things about physical gold, physical silver in your possession is that privacy. I think Very that's... well said. Very well said, Lynette. I was actually interviewing the, the Ottawa uh, trucker convoy on my radio oh. station, which is international in scope. I, the, I had the organizers on. I, I was I, not me alone, but I was a big part of getting their GoFundMe page started and getting the donations flowing into them. And it just like un unbelievable. All I wanted was to people to donate a hundred bucks and get a t-shirt and a hat for heaven's sakes. Okay. Yeah. And, and it just went to suddenly they had $10 million flowing in. I mean, people just jumped in. And GoFundMe stopped it. They 
they flushed them. Wow. I mean, it's like, it, uh, why? So I'm interviewing the, the organizers of this in, in, in Ottawa and giving them a platform. And all they were saying, Lynette, was like, you know, half of us are pro-vaccinations, half of us aren't. But the point is, we just need to have control over our bodies. We have to, don't make it exactly. mandatory. Don't force us to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And all they wanted was a meeting. Uh, they wanted just to be have have an errands, airing of their grievances. They would have packed up and went right back. These are not the enemy. They're 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 good, hardworking men and women, blue collar that keep the supply of goods going. My right. heavens, I mean, Mr. Trudeau, shame on you for not treating them with respect Absolutely. and with honor. And, and I would say for anybody else, because then things happened and all of a sudden that was no longer in the news. But, you know, people need to be aware of how easily, if everything you own is held inside the system. Very good point. I wanted to, I wanted to end with that because <sighs> this is huge. The huge. organizers didn't know what it meant to have their bank accounts frozen, okay? They never dreamt that they would be treated as an enemy combatant, like an enemy nation. Right. Okay? These are citizens of Canada, for heaven's sakes. They're the people next door. They're the people that bring goods and services. I mean, goods, they're, they're the lifeblood of commerce. These are the men and women that do that. Yes. And the, the, the organizers of it had their bank accounts frozen. The story behind the story, Lynette, is they didn't know what that meant. The one fellow that I, and I won't, he asked me not to mention his name, so I, I respect that. But he, he was very pride, prideful as far as thinking he was doing good as a, a good citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, a good patriotic, if you want to call it that, right. Canadian citizen. And he had a, he had about a, just under half a million Canadian dollars in his bank account. And he had two trucks that he owed, that he owed debt on, Okay. When his accounts were frozen, immediately they came in and were able to, to haul his truck away. And that set him off, first of all. And when, he, when, he, when Trudeau issued the Emergency Powers Act, he didn't understand, well, okay, I'm, I can't buy or sell or trade anything, but if I'm a good boy, if I retreat back and say I'm sorry, I'll be back in the saddle again. No, he never got his trucks back and his counts were gone, zero. And when they froze, when, they, when that means when you froze, freeze the accounts, you can't go do anything anymore. His life is over. And it wasn't just he, the bank accounts. It was any crypto accounts. It was the GoFundMe accounts. It was insurance accounts, everything, everything. It was a, he, he says, he, he, was, he was weeping to me. A grown man, a tough guy, who had the best of intentions, weeping like a child, says, "I'm done. I have. I'm not. A, I'm a non-person anymore." Now that's the type of power these central bankers can wield. Yep. And that's a problem. I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, yeah. If you have any breath in your lungs, that's a problem. I I definitely agree, and I think. Everybody needs to be aware of what could happen. And it's critically important. I mean, critically important that you are, that we are all as independent and self-sufficient and that we come together in community because that is the only way that we can take the central, but this and this visible silver too. I just don't happen to have any, this is yeah. the biggest, this is like central bankers kryptonite. <laughs> that's, that's the way to go. Way to go, superwoman. You're <laughs> right. That's exactly right. And let me tell you a little bit parenthetical of that because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help my, my brothers and sisters uh, up in Canada and, and then Australia. I mean, the, what's happening yes. in Australia with this, this stuff happening is happening all over the world. Oh my it, God. It's, it's, it's insane. And if you don't think it can happen in, in America, <laughs> you're dead wrong. It is going to happen. That's yes. the whole reason why. The, you know, I, it's already happening, but we're not yeah. hearing as much about it yet. Yes. So I'm, I'm, again, I don't know when. I don't have a specific date in mind. But if you look at the trends, 
I mean, the, the, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of International Settlements have no choice. The U.S. dollar is, I mean, come on, we have what? Done. $36 trillion more than the whole um, asset base of America. It's the, the, the debt is out of control. Not, it, it dwarfs what happened in the Weimar Republic. It just yeah. dwarfs it. So we have one, they have one choice, one, one gold ring to grasp, and that is the digital currency to come in and make the dollar bill obsolete. It's going to happen. I don't know when, it may be, it may be this December. Depends on how bad, you know, smoking right. Joe is there, you know, uh, as to his popularity level. But make them, the only way they can save anything is to bring in the, the controls of the central bank digital currency, the CBDC. Yeah. When that happens, then you have all the, they have all the control, you have nothing. But you know Absolutely what's happening nothing. right now that I find, I mean, I think this is so killer interesting. I mean, if, if you can just step back and watch, and that is the BRICS nations creating a basket currencies to rival the predominantly American-based uh, SDR special drawing rights over at the IMF. Mm -hmm. That is so fascinating to me because we've got battles going on all over the place. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves because I've really felt and talked about since 2009 the SDR as a basket of currencies, an expandable basket of currencies to take over as the world reserve currency from the U.S. dollar. And with their substitution fund, where if, you're, if you own uh, U.S. dollar denominated instruments, which they like to call assets, but they're not really assets in my mind. They can deposit it into the substitution account and then they're converted into SDR denominated instruments or assets, whatever, whatever you like. Um, but I wish I could say that I really thought it was a them or us, but I really don't. I really don't think that. I really think that that um, everything is consolidated down to just such a small group that it's all smoke and mirrors just to nudge us in the direction that they want us to go in. And that Keep is all mind. digital. So we, we go back to what is, how do, we, how do we combat this? Well, first of all, I just love what you guys are doing. The ITC group is educating people. Thank you. Whether you understand it or not, folks, you know, the prophet Hosea said it best in the Bible, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And if you understand these things, how are you ever going to stop them or, or protect yourself from them happening? Exactly. Okay? So we have to, to, to unite as grassroots. We have to unite as, you know, and I, I, I give this example out of what happened in 1933 with the FDR's executive order, making it, what, five ounces of, of gold is right. illegal. Why was that an executive order and not an actual, shall we say, congressionally passed law? Okay, there were specific penalties in the executive order, felony, felony penalties and right. jail time, okay? Why did, it was only like, I, I, I did the research on this, Lynette, there was like six people prosecuted. They were very high profile cases people uh, that refused to, to, to do what they were told and, and they were given, you know, $10,000 fines and took all, you know, they, they were sent jail times. Right. But what is untold is the people in the Midwest, especially the farmers, the United, and they said uh, there was co-ops of 10,000, 20,000 people. They got together and they, they just basically gave the two fingers to FDR said, this is our money, our wealth, come and get it, bring the tanks, bring the bullets, because we're not going to give up our gold. And you know what? They looked the other way, and they went around them. That's the power of grassroots binding together and yeah. saying, no, we the people have the power. You do not, Mr. President, no matter what executive order you think you have, no matter how many central bankers you have in your cabinet, or in your closet hiding away. No, it is us 
and our wealth. And I think oh. that's what needs to happen here in a big, big way. Oh. Educated people saying, this is us. Don't play around with us anymore. Right. Don't tread on us. <laughs> <Don't>, right. <laughs> okay. We need to stand up and be be counted. And and I, I'm not afraid to rock the boat. I'm not a, I'm not afraid to anymore. It's, it's, I love this country too much. I love the people in it. I just see them being used and abused, and it just oh saddens gosh, me. Yes. My favorite question is: How many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? <laughs> Right. Great quote. Was that so, was that a was that a Zangism? You know, I don't think so. I don't think I can claim that. I have used it for so many years. I don't even remember. <laughs> well, I, don't I, even... I call it a Zangism. That's Lynette <laughs> Lynette Zangism. <laughs> Zangism. Every once in a while, I come up with a truism myself. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good one. I mean, golly. You've got to get an empirical handle on the truth as it is, as it is now, and as it will be in the future. Exactly. And, and that's where the power of gold and silver is. Exactly, because we vote with our purses, right? Yes. If you buy into what they're selling, that's exactly what they want. So if you're if you're comfortable of thinking about this as having value, or certainly in the digital world, Oh, look at all those numbers. We get blinded by those numbers. But this is actually out of the system. This is a central bank kryptonite. And we all need to hold it to protect ourselves and come together in community because we all have, you know, different skill sets and different experiences. And that's what makes a rich community and how we can weather that. So, yeah, I, I think... My my father Lynette was wounded in action in Korea. Um, was spent he spent almost a full year in a hospital ship in Tokyo. Wow. When he was uh, released with his discharge and and uh, his medical papers, he had a uh, I think it was eleven hundred twelve hundred dollars in a discharge check. So he comes back to Southern Utah, and this is in his in his little diary he kept, uh, and there's pictures of his time. He he lost his left arm, pretty much the use of it, uh, with his war with his war wounds, and and he went and he he thought, well, I'm just gonna I, I'm gonna just go to the bank and cash this GI uh, twelve hundred dollar check, and he took it all in silver dollars, Morgan peace dollars. Oh wow! He so says I felt like Dillinger. Three. I had these these big bags. I walked out, <laughs> bags. Of, but he says I just wanted to have it because it you know. Part of his part of his post traumatic stress disorder. He didn't want paper any either. So he had these. Ch but here's the bottom line. He went out and he he bought himself five n nice civvy suits, right? And then he went and paid his widowed mother, my my grandmother's uh, uh, bills that had, that piled up at the mercantile. They they knew they let her carry credit, but he paid it all off with silver dollars, stacked them up on the counter. After all was said and done, he has like seven hundred and thirty something. Silver Morgans left. So guess what my father did to go find my mother to be a hot guy with a brand new civvy suit and go play the play the. He bought a a four door, uh, a Studebaker, brand new up <laughs> Tri-State Motors in Cedar City, Utah. How much? Paid, paid cash, seven hundred and something out the door. <laughs> okay, and there was receipts in his papers after he passed. I was going over his. And I just saw that I just got teary-eyed because yeah. $700, let's say, in peace in, in silver e, silver dollars, peace, peace dollars today, the numismatic value, looking, when I looked at this over, it was they were about $40 a piece. Yeah, okay? that sounds about right. 700 times 40, $28,000. That's just the silver count in it. If you look at some of them as the highest sixty or seventy dollars based on the quality the, of their right and organs. the year okay. and all of that, yeah. So say thirty thousand dollars of silver at the time. If we had still that same bags of junk silver today, whatever you want to call it, because it's not junk at all. It's really good stuff. Okay? Right. It would be anywhere if you could buy at least one Studebaker four door today, uh, maybe two, depending on the quality of the of the piece dollars he had. I mean. That's the story. 
It is of, the story. It holds of its sound purchasing money. power value so that yeah. no matter when you go to use it, you are, because think about it, that was his labor. That was his payment for losing his arm, for going to war, for being in the hospital for a year. And so you want to think that what I went through has value forever, but in this system, it doesn't. By design, no. it loses value. This system, it does because it's real and broadest base of buyer because it's used everywhere in the economy, gold and physical gold and physical silver as well. Well, this has been phenomenal. Um, would you like to do a little bit of self-promotion in here? So people will have all the links to um, the sites and some of your YouTube videos, et cetera. But is there any parting message that you would like to leave our viewers with? Oh, absolutely. And thanks so much for the opportunity to, to share. This is we a appreciate it. It's part of developing the community. Thank you so much because it, it it's one of my real strong suits. My my mind, uh, they uh, part of this uh, this whole thing that that in, that got me the scholarship to 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 New York in the first place was this top two percentile. My brain is wired a little bit differently. They told right. me I see things more in the future. And I get very, very quickly frustrated when people can't see what I can see. You have it to have seems patience, like it's so though. clear. <laughs> I know, but we really have to have patience because yeah. you have to lead them, right? And, and I lead by example, you lead by example, but we, we can't get frustrated. You know, I've been doing no, this for a the, long time. And my sweetheart, my, my, my bride of 41 years, when this all came, and we did the they did analysis and they did the personal personality profile. She's like, that's him. He gets so mad when he, people can't see what he sees. So I think it's so elementary and so simple. I know. Why can't people see this? So it's I have to I maybe it's, you know I'm 62. I was born in 59. So I'm 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 getting to the point baby. where I'm saying I'm I got to be more patient, but. Uh, people like you, Lynette, that see it, mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm so happy. Uh, it gives me hope that, that we you. can do this together. Yeah, uh, because... I mean, that's what gives me hope too. And I even have little ones that, you know, I just did a video with my eight-year-old grandson, who's actually about to turn nine, on what is money. And then I was recently at the George Gammon event, and there was... I think she was about seven or eight years old and um, had them following me and she came up on stage and we played central banker. I mean, that's what gives me hope though, is Good. when I yeah. see people that do understand it because more and more people are understanding, especially with the high inflation, that that makes them question. That makes them question. This. Great, great point. Right? Great point. Because and price stability that the central banks keep talking about, but never really defining for you, is not that if this cup of coffee cost you five bucks last year, it's going to cost you five bucks next year. The price stability is that if you don't perceive the prices as going up, they can go up, they can go up as high as they want. But if it doesn't bother you enough for you to ask for more money, that's the price stability. You, the worker, not asking for what's truly due and accepting less and less and less until. Boom. I would just, uh, in closing, I'd just like to, to have our listeners just do your own homework and, and read the Absolutely. 1792 Coinage Act. The reason why our founding fathers said it was a felony and guilty of death for messing with our, with our coinage was because the Thomas Jeffersons of the world knew exactly you can't hold your republic without sound money. Exactly. You can't be free without it. Uh, exactly. I get, so <laughs> I get so frustrated when people say, well, I, I, I support the Constitution. I had this discussion with, with our, our county sheriff. Do you really, sheriff, support the Constitution? Yes, I do. I honor and sustain the Constitution. I said, then what's in your wallet? And I'm not talking about Capital One. Right. Look at me and says, what are you talking about? 
I said, those bills you have in your wallet are not constitutional money. Yeah. Article 1, Section 8, Article 1, Section 10. What part of that don't you get, Mr. Sheriff? Uh, I says, oh, I get it. You haven't even read it. Well, maybe you should go read it. Listen, there is nothing in there about Federal Reserve notes, paper money being anything, anything valid. It's unconstitutional. Yeah. It's only gold and silver coin in payment of debt. End of story. And there's whenever somebody works for somebody else, there's a sacred debt there. Okay? You can't discharge that debt, Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, except with gold and silver. You give them a Federal Reserve note or promise to pay or a widget wire transfer, they're still in debt to you. Right. Oh, my goodness. That's, we can do a whole other two-hour segment on that. <laughs> but, we can. But that, and, maybe, and we'll have you back. And we'll have, a, we'll have another segment on it because this was very interesting, and I really appreciate it so much for your coming. And to all of you out there, I hope you got as much out of this conversation as I did. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. And remember, gold, physical silver in your possession is your absolute best protection for what we're going through right now and what lies in our very near future. So until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lynette. Thank you.